I'm going to introduce your presiding judge. Well, you're here, you'll meet your jurors after the trial. Your presiding judge is Gonzalo Frasis, dean at Anderson School here at UCLA, and a Hall of Fame coach in the American Montreal Association with five, six, eight, I don't even remember how many national championships. Five. Unbelievable. The most ever. Congratulations. We're thrilled to have you as our presiding judge. You're in good hands. Your Honor, have fun. Thanks. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Great to see all of you. Uh, I will call the case of the State of Peter Jones versus Dragon Studios. Uh, would the parties like to state their appearances for the record? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, good morning. My name is Jonathan Huff. Alongside me today is my co-counsel, Mr. Michael Ragnoni. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Today we're representing the Jones family in this action. Would you like to hear appearances from the defense first? Sure, and then if there's pre-trial matters, we can attend to those. Hello. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Josiah Jones, and today I'm joined by my co-counsel, Mr. Dylan Darwin. Morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Together, we represent the defendant in today's trial, Dragon Studios Incorporated, joined at council table by the director of that studio, Mr. Cole Dole. Good morning. Good morning. Your Honor, a few pre-trial matters to settle. Of course. Uh, first, Your Honor, we'd like to have rule, rule 615, that's just the constructive sequestration of all witnesses barring party representatives. In this case, the plaintiff has no party representative. No objection. No objection, Your Honor. All right, uh, Rule 16 will be invoked. Second, Your Honor, we'd like to tender to the court a bench book full of relevant documents, including pretrial orders, evidentiary rulings, jury instructions in the verdict form in today's case. Okay, I do have the full case here. If you think it's, you know, so I'm fine with this unless Perfect. I think it's just easier if you just reference. Please be on back your honor. Sorry, I just shut off my phone uh, to um, to silence it. So I, but then I realized that the ballot's electronic, so I turned it back on. So, <laughs> go ahead. Last, your honor, we'd just like to ask your preferences about movement about the courtroom. Are we free to move about the well? Yes, uh, you're free to move uh, in front of council table, certainly, and if you need to approach the bench constructively, or the witness, please ask for permission for that. But other than that, you can move freely about the, the courtroom here. Yes, Your Honor. With that, the plaintiff is ready to proceed. Thank you very much. Defense, anything from you? Yes, Your Honor, just a couple of things. First, per Rule 615, Mr. Doig will be our party representative today. All right, so noted. Next, Your Honor, just as a matter of procedure, the one of the parties in this case is named Peter Jones. He's the person who passed away. So, Your Honor, just for the court's state reference and clarity of record, I'd like to assume that any time we're referencing Mr. Jones, not talking about myself, talking about Mr. Jones. <laughs> Duly noted, Mr. Other Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Your Honor, today we've prepared an exhibit binder containing all the exhibits that we may speak with witnesses about. Do we have your permission to put a copy of that on the witness stand? Certainly. No objection? No objection, Your Honor. That, that's no problem. Thank you. We'd just like to add, Your Honor, that a number of those exhibits are pre-admitted, including exhibits 1 through 25. Do we have your permission to use those throughout opening statements if necessary? Yes. Uh, the only thing I would ask, obviously, if you're 
you know, referencing an exhibit with a witness just to reference the number so we know which one you're talking about. Yes, Your Honor. With those things, we're ready for opening statements. Great. All right. Plaintiff. <coughs> yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? You may. When he needed a signal, the defendant was silent. It's June 21st, 2023, and Peter Jones, a famous Hollywood actor, is standing on top of a mountain. It's 3,000 feet tall, and he's on a motorcycle, and getting ready to go off a ramp. His newest stunt for his new movie. But you see, the way this stunt works is he doesn't do it alone. He's got help. He's got an earpiece in his ear. Someone in the control room, the defendant in this case, is going to tell him when to pull his parachute as he jumps off. He needs that signal. And so, on that day, Peter Jones rubs up his bike, and he flies off. And when the time comes, he lands safely. He gets on the ground and people are cheering, wow, that was amazing. But the defendant isn't happy about it. The defendant comes up to Peter and says, hey, we need to do it again. Let's think bigger. Wait to pull your parachute, I'll give you the signal. That's it's safe. So Peter agrees. And the next day, he's back on top of that mountain, back on top of that bike. He's nervous. <clears throat> but he knows he's going to get the signal. So he gets ready, flies off that, flies off that mountain. As the time comes, as Peter is hurtling to the ground, this is what he hears. Silence. He doesn't get the signal. Doesn't know when to pull his parachute. Pulls it too late. Peter Jones dies that day. The defendant didn't give him the signal. When he needed that signal, the defendant was silent. Members of the jury, when a company does something like that, doesn't reasonably care for its employees, it's against the law. It's called negligence. And that's what we're suing the defendant in this case, Dragon Studios, for. Today that means we have a burden. It's our job to prove that this company was negligent that Peter Jones died, and that Peter Jones died because of this company's negligence. We have to prove that by a preponderance of the evidence, just more likely than not. And we're going to do that today. And we'll do it by showing you three parts of this movie. The stuff, the signal, and the sign. Let's start with that first one, the stunt. You're going to hear just how dangerous this stunt was. How it was off a mountainside. How it was 3,000 feet down. Members of the jury, when we get to stunts like this, you got to take precautions. And you'll learn that this company had some. It was the defendant's job to let Peter know when to pull his parachute on that earpiece. It was his job to give him a signal. That's our second. Mr. you're going to hear that Peter needed this signal to survive. That if he didn't get it, he was never going to make it. Then you'll get to hear about that third. Silence. You'll hear that when Peter needed that signal, the defendant 
said nothing. You'll hear that when it was the defendant's job to protect Peter, to keep him safe, he stayed silent. Throughout today's trial, we're going to ask you to look close at the evidence. See who you believe and see who you doubt. Every single time they call a witness, every single time Mr. Jones stands right here, I want you to think about that signal. Think about whether when he needed a signal, if he got silent. Thank you. Uh, nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Defense, do you wish to make an opening? We do, Your Honor. Thank you. May I proceed? You may. May I please court. They wanted to keep their star safe. Members of the jury, what happened to Peter Jones was a tragedy. Every single person in this courtroom can agree that he should not have died that day. But the way Mr. Hubbard tells this story, you might believe that Dragon Studios, they just sat back and let this happen. <clears throat> but the evidence in this case is going to show that that's just not the case. Instead, what you're going to find out is that this company took extensive measures to make sure that Mr. Jones was safe. You're going to learn they put a full-fledged team together to make sure that every single move that he did was calculated. You're going to learn that they trained him for hours upon hours upon hours to make sure that this was perfect. You're going to learn that they spent millions of dollars of their own money making sure this was tested, making sure that this was safe. But sometimes, even when we do our best to make sure that something is safe, tragedy strikes. That's what happened to Mr. Jones that day. Today you're going to find out that it wasn't the fault of this company because they wanted to keep their star safe. That's a problem for the plaintiff today. Because when they walked through those courtroom doors, they brought with them a burden to prove to you by a preponderance of the evidence that this company was negligent. That means they can't just stand up here and claim that the defendant was silent and didn't give a signal. Because you're going to hear evidence today to the contrary. You're going to hear evidence that this company wasn't silent, that Mr. Doig did give that signal. And when there's conflicting evidence, you're going to find out that the law requires proof. They don't have that proof today, members of the jury. That's why they're going to fail to meet their burden. They're going to fail to meet their burden because of three facts that they just won't be able to explain. One, they put a team in place to make sure he was safe. Two, they used state-of-the-art technology to make sure that he was safe. And three, they trained him extensively to make sure that he was safe. So I want to take you through those one at a time, starting with his team. Because today you're going to find out that Mr. Jones, he wasn't alone up there. They had built a carefully crafted team to make sure that this stunt was going to be okay. In fact, you're going to hear that they hired a stunt coordinator. Someone who crafted every single detail of that plan to make sure that it was industry standard. To make sure that it was safe for him to do. To make sure that nothing was going to go wrong. Their team was built to keep Mr. Jones safe. It's going to take us to the second thing we're going to prove to you today. 
That technology. Because you're going to hear about all the technology that this movie studio used to make sure that they could track their stall. You're going to hear about drones positioned around Mr. Jones. You're going to hear about trackers that they placed on him, on his equipment. You're going to hear how they wanted to make sure that they knew at all times where he was at in the air. Why? Because you're going to learn it was important for them to make sure that he was safe. This was a person that was important to this studio. It was a person that you're going to learn. They put effort into protecting through their technology. It's going to bring us to the last thing that we're going to prove to you today. Training. Because members of the jury, you don't get to do training stunts like this without going through some practice. I want you to look at these close. Because Mr. Jones, he was trained to do these things. The studio required that he do 500 jumps, 500 skydives, and they built him a course specifically so he could train on this exact stunt. You're going to learn that they spent millions of dollars just making sure that they had tested this properly. <coughs> the team, the technology, the training. See, when things like that are in place to make sure that someone was safe, that's not a company that doesn't care about their person. That's not a company that has breached their duty of care. What you're going to learn is that this company wanted to make sure their star was safe. In cases like this, it can be easy to want to point the finger at the easy part the company who was working with Mr. Jones that day. But I want you to remember that we don't come to courtrooms like this to do what's easy. We come to courtrooms like this one to do what's right. And what you're going to find out that happened today is that this studio took extensive measures to make sure Mr. Jones was safe. That they didn't fail to give him that signal that all they wanted was to keep their star safe. Because of that, the plaintiff is going to fail to meet that burden of proof today. That's why at the end of this trial, I'll stand before you again, and I'll ask that you find Dragon Studios not liable. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Plaintiff, do you wish to call your first witness? Yes, Your Honor. Plaintiff calls Eli Gugulian. All right, Mr. Gugulian, please step forward. You've been previously sworn. May I proceed? Of course. Uh, could you please introduce yourself to the members of the jury? Good morning. Uh, my name is Eli Gogion. Uh, I apologize, sir. Not a problem, sir. What do you do for a living? Well, I, I'm an agent for the stars here in Hollywood. How'd you get into that? Well, I, I, I came to Hollywood about 20 years ago. Showed up to my first audition hoping for the best. And they told me I wasn't cut out to act. So I, I figured it was best for me to become an agent so I, I could still be involved. How are you involved in today's case? I, I was Peter's, uh, Mr. Jones's agent. I, I represented him in the movie he was in. And uh, I was there on the day he passed away. How did Peter pass away? It, it was a stunt. Uh, he had this big stunt that he'd been prepared for in that movie. And uh, he, he didn't make it. Um, I, I lost a client that day, sir. But above all, I, I lost a close friend of mine. Sir, I'm sorry we have to, but I, I want to talk about that stunt. What exactly was it? What, what was he doing? Peter, he, he was ambitious. He, uh, 
he, he was going to drive a, a motorcycle uh, off of this cliff and parachute to safety. So he was going to drive a motorcycle off a cliff and parachute to safety. Would you recognize any photos of the stunt area if I showed them to you? Sure, sir. Your Honor, approach the opposing counsel with copies of Exhibits 16 and 17. These are pre-admitted. Which Your Honor, you have a copy? I have copies here. Thank you. Here you go. And may I publish this to the jury, Your Honor? Of course. Uh, well, why don't... Oh, that's right. It's pre-admitted. Okay. So you are you admitting this into evidence? Yes, they're pre, they're all pre they're pre-admitted. They're pre-admitted, Got it. Great. Thank you. Uh, sir, what exactly are we looking at? Well, we're, we're looking at a mountainside. Uh, so we're about 2,700 feet in the air here. And, and this is a ramp that Mr. Jones had built to uh, ride his motorcycle off. Sir, was he going to do all this alone, just by himself? Uh, no, sir. He had help. What kind of help? Someone was supposed to be in his earpiece giving him a signal for when to pull his parachute. He said he was going to get a signal. I want to talk about that. Would you recognize that earpiece if I showed it to you? Sure. Your Honor, this is pre-admitted as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, what are we looking at here? Th this is the earpiece that uh, Mr. Jones was wearing when he did that stunt. Well, how did the system work? What, what would happen? He put, puts it in his ear and then what? Right, so he, he would put this in his ear when he was on the ground, and, and then he'd ride that motorcycle off this cliff, and, and then someone like Mr. Doig would, would give him the signal, and, and Mr. Jones would pull his parachute and hopefully land safely. Sir, you said Mr. Doig was supposed to give him the signal. Well, how did that first jump go when he went off? It was good. My friend landed on the ground safely. After he landed on the ground safely, how did the defendant react? Mr. Doig said that uh, that that footage we got, it, it was too short to be compelling for the audience. He said it was too short. Did he say how he wanted to make it longer? He asked Mr. Jones to wait before pulling his parachute to to fall for longer. He wanted him to wait to pull his parachute. How long did he say to wait? Nine seconds. Objection, Your Honor, so lack of foundation. Response. Your Honor, the foundation's on the record. He says it's a statement that he heard. Your Honor, the question as phrased asks the witness to go a step further than the foundation that we actually have on the record. What the witness testified to was Mr. Doig saying he was going to ask Mr. Jones to wait a little bit longer to give the signal, that's different than asking Mr. Jones to wait longer to pull his parachute. Those are two different things. Your Honor, the objections lack a foundation. The foundation is on the record. The witness testified. I, I heard him say that he wanted him to wait nine seconds. That's all the foundation we need to lay. It's a 7-1. Right. And could you repeat the question just so I could make a, a final ruling? Yes, Your Honor. I believe the question was, did he say how long he wanted him to wait? Response, Your Honor. Um, I'm going to give him a little leeway. So yes, Your Honor. Over -over. Yes, Your Honor. So, sir, how long did he want him to wait before he pulled his parachute? It, it was nine seconds. Nine seconds. I want to talk about the day of. Would you recognize a video of Peter's final jump? I would, sir. Your Honor, this time I'm showing the witness a video of that jump. This has also been pre-admitted into evidence. All right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ragnar is going to be on the controls for pause. Uh, sir, how exactly did this stunt work? Well, where were you the day of? I, I was in the control room. I, I was actually watching footage uh, a lot like this of Mr. Jones' jump. Were you able to see that video when you were in the control room? That's right. Sir, you just told us that he wanted us, he wanted to wait nine seconds before he gave him the signal. We're going to play the video. And I want you to tell us the stop when Cole, when the defendant gave him the signal. Okay? All right. Uh, Mr. Agnani, go ahead and play. Sir, 
stop it. Sort of, it's been nine seconds. Has he given the signal yet? No, he hasn't. Okay, let's play it some more. Stop. Sir, it's been about 15 seconds. Has he given him the signal at 15? No, he hasn't. So when did he give him the signal to pull his parachute? He never gave him the signal. He was silent. Thank you. That's further, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross examination. Can I retrieve this from the witness? Uh, yes. Unless you need it. No, Your Honor. Can I grab the earpiece from the state? Yes, you may. Thank you, sir. You may proceed. You may. Good afternoon, sir. Good morning, sir. It is morning. Thank you. You are absolutely right. It is, sir. <laughs> sir, I want to pick up. It is. I want to pick up right where you left off, talking about a couple of things that you mentioned when you were speaking with Mr. Hubbard, okay? Oh, okay. Sir, you talked to us about an earpiece that was in Mr. Jones' ear. I have that here. You said that, right? That's right. That's the one I just handed you, sir. And then you talked to us about an interaction that you observed with Mr. Doig in the control room. That's what you said? Right. Okay. I want to take a two, those two things one at a time, starting with that earpiece. Okay. This is it, right? That's right, sir. Sir, you, this is the earpiece that was in Mr. Jones's ear, right? That's right. Sir, I just want to be clear about what you do and don't know about this earpiece. Because, sir, the truth is, you weren't ever up there with Mr. Jones, were you? Up on the motorcycle. That's right, sir. No, no, sir. I, I was never on that motorcycle. I never tried it for myself. So you couldn't possibly tell us what kind of messages he was receiving through this earpiece? I don't know what he heard in that earpiece, no, sir. You couldn't tell us whether it was functioning properly at all times? No. You couldn't tell us whether any of the weather conditions from being on a mountain had an impact on this earpiece? I have no idea. Well, let's talk about that interaction you spoke with us about. Because you told us that you were in a control room with Mr. Doy, right? That's right. That was on June 21st, right? Right, sir. Sir, what you're telling the members of the jury today is that June 21st, that was the first time Mr. Doig ever didn't give a signal, right? Uh, well, he was doing the jumps that we were shooting? Uh, yes, but uh, he'd done some training runs and stuff like that before. That's right, so those training runs, Mr. Doig was still the person responsible for giving those signals, right? Sure, that's right. And every single time that you were there, he did give it, right? Right. Not just one time, right, sir? No, not just one time. Not two times, right, Objection, sir? Your Honor. Under 404, this is improper character evidence. Response. Stay in this spot. Yes, Your Honor. Under 404B2, we're using this for preparation. That's an accepted use of character evidence. We're offering this testimony to show that the defendant company, Dragon Studios, prepared Mr. Jones for this jump on June 21st by having him do it multiple times successfully. Your Honor, may I respond? Yes. Your Honor, they are not using this for the 404B purpose of preparation. They told you in their opening statement they were going to show that he did give the signal. This evidence goes to that, Your Honor. The fact is that if he had given the signal so many other times, it's more likely that he gave the signal this time. And that's the inference that the jury is going to take. 404 protects against that, Your Honor, and they're not allowed to use it for that purpose. But there is a legitimate purpose under 404B, so I will rule. Yes, Your Honor. Well, sir, we were talking about those six other training runs that you had done at this stunt. You remember that? Right, sir. Sir, those six other times, Mr. Doig, he did give that signal, right? That's right. And every other time, Mr. Jones, he was able to deploy that parachute. Right. On each of the six runs, he deployed that chute and he, he landed safely. But you told us that June 21st, that was the first time it didn't happen. Right, sir. Sir, that was stressful for you, wasn't it? 
watching my friend jump off a cliff? Right, sir. I, I, I sure say it would. You were panicking, weren't you? Uh, a little bit. You were screaming at Mr. Doyle. You remember that? Well, I, I remember telling him to, to give the signal. That's right. Sir, you were the only other person in that control room, isn't that true? Th that's right, it, it was him and I. You weren't recording at any time, were right? No, I, I wasn't recording the control room. To your knowledge, sir, there aren't any other cameras about this conversation, right? I I'm not sure. So, sir, if Mr. Doig took the stand today and said he did give that signal, the only evidence you have to contradict that, well, that's your word, right? I, I can just tell you what I know, sir. That's right, sir. The only evidence you have about what happened in that control room, that's what you can tell us, right? Right. Then I want to talk about some of the things that Dragon Studios did do to make sure Mr. Jones was safe. My apologies, Your Honor. Sir, you're aware of some of the precautionary measures that the studio took to make sure Mr. Jones was safe, right? Right. We, we had signed a contract with some of the safety plan, the, the things we were going to follow when he did this jump. We're going to get to that in just a moment, sir, but you worked with a team, right? Right. We, we had a safety team to make sure Mr. Jones was safe. You got to observe some of the technology that was in place, right? Uh, sure. I, I saw some diagrams, stuff like that. And Mr. Jones, he went through extensive training to make sure he was ready, right? Right. Mr. Jones was, he, he was committed. Let's take those one piece at a time, because you just talked with us a little bit about a document that you signed with the plan that happened that day. You remember doing that? Right, so that's that contract. You'd recognize it if I showed it to you? Sure would. Can you use that binder in front of you to flip to Exhibit 34? Just let me know when you're there. Is it 34? That's right, sir. All right. That's that document you were talking about, right? Yes. It's a stunt plan, true? That's right. It lays out the plans for what's going to happen in that stunt. That's right. You see Mr. Jones' signature at the bottom there? That's right. And this is accurate. It hasn't been changed or altered in any way, right? It, it looks just like I, I saw it when I, when I signed it. We offer Exhibit 34, Your Honor. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor, specifically to the last section of Exhibit 34, uh, the bullet point that says according to industry standards. Spirit. You know, and what's the grounds? Yes, sir. It's a 702 opinion. All right. Your Honor, we actually don't intend on using that within this document at all, so we're absolutely fine with redacting that. So you're suggesting redacting out the first sentence or that entire bullet? Uh, we would want to redact specifically from according all the way at the end of the sentence. Yes. To, it, above, it also, above, to above ground level? Yes, Your Honor. All right. It, also towards the bottom when it talks about this is based on body and free fall calculations. All right. Uh, why don't we just uh, redact out the first and, and last sentence in that paragraph just to make it simple. Perfect. So it will be, uh, so your overrule is subject to the redaction of those two sentences. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Just to clarify, 34 is in evidence with those yes, redactions. Yes, that is correct. So, sir, looking at this document here, this document, it's a plan you worked on together, right? That's right. I worked on it with our, our safety team and Mr. Jones. Namely, the people, one of the people on that safety team, that was a stunt coordinator, right? Right. Uh, Ms. Sky Stevens. Someone who went over all the details with you and Mr. Jones, right? That's right. Now let's talk about something else, that technology we've mentioned. Sir, can you flip in that binder for me to exhibit nine? Nine. This is pre admitted. Yeah. All right. Sir, you recognize that photo too, don't you? Right. This is Mr. Jones on a motorcycle. All right, sir. And in the corner there, you actually see a drone, right? Right. That's how we're getting footage. Sir, you saw that they were using these drones throughout the course of Mr. Jones doing his filming, right? Right. They were using these drones to track his location. Right. They were using a control room to monitor exactly where he was in the air. That's right. This was for the, the safety schematic that they were putting together. Sir, you even know that they put a tracker on Mr. Jones, right? That's right. Not just Mr. Jones, but on his bike, too. Right. Sir, you saw them monitoring exactly where Mr. Jones was every single time he ever did a scot, right? Every time I was there, yeah. I just want to talk about the last piece, sir. Some of the training that he went through. 
Sir, you understand that Mr. Jones, he did a lot of training to get ready for this, right? Right. He, he did some 500 run-throughs of this. 500 run-throughs of jumps? Right. 500 run-throughs of skydives? Right. Sir, he even did multiple run-throughs of the exact stunt that was being done on June 21st. That's right. Sir, you know that it didn't just stop at those 500 practice runs, right? What do you mean? Can you flip to exhibit 16 for me? Oh, right. I, I got two of them. Sir, that's a ramp, right? That's right. A pretty large one, right? Right, this, this is the ramp you're using. And you said something on direct examination. You said, Mr. Jones had this put in? Well, I, I don't know if it was him specifically, but this was his stunt, yeah. Well, sir, you actually know that the studio paid money to build this, right? Well, that's right. Paid money to build this ramp so Mr. Jones could practice. That's right. Sir, you know that each of those precautionary measures they were taken before Mr. Jones ever did a single skydive. They took a, a lot of precautions, that's right. Thank you for your time today, sir. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Thank you. Uh, Counsel, any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Sir, uh, Mr. Jones talked a lot about precautionary measures, what the studio did to help keep him safe. Do you remember that? I remember that, sir. Did the studio ever train him on what he was going to do if he didn't get a signal? I, I don't think he was ever trained on that, no. Did you ever, do you know if the studio ever told him, we're not going to give you a signal, uh, hope you can figure it out? No, that, that signal, that was in the contract we signed. Uh, sir, when the defendant chose and told him to wait nine seconds, did he say, it's because I wanted to keep you safe? That's not what he said, no. What, what did he say? He said they needed more footage. Nothing further. Recross? No recross for the witness, Your Honor. All right. The witness may be excused. With, with that, Your Honor, the plaintiff's case, uh, we'd like to rest. All right. Thank you, Mr. Robillo. So, all right. Um, we'll be ready for the defense. Witness. You may. We call Mr. Coldoy. Mr. Doug, you say forward. Thanks. May I proceed? You may. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Would you please introduce yourself to the members of the jury? Hi, my name is Cole Doig. What do you do for a living, sir? I'm a producer. I run my own production company. It's called Dragon Studios. How'd you get into that line of work? Well, growing up, I was obsessed with movies. My first favorite was Wizard of Oz. I remember when I was five or six, I just sat in front of the TV watching it over and over and over again. First, I wanted to be an actor. I went to Hollywood, started out as an assistant, working for anyone who would hire me. Eventually, I became a uh, screenwriter, worked my way up, eventually got into production. Mr. Doig, do you know why it is that you're here in court today? I do. I'm being accused of causing the death of one of the lead actors in our films, Peter Jones. Sir, I want to give you the chance right off the bat to respond to some of the plaintiff's allegations today. Have you been present throughout trial to hear all of them? I have, yes. Sir, did you fail to communicate with Mr. Jones about what your plan was on June 21st? No. Like you heard today, we had a whole safety plan that we signed, that Peter signed. And specifically before the 21st, we had a whole conversation about what we were going to do today. And Peter agreed. Peter was ready to go. Did you fail to consult your safety staff 
on what your plan was? No, we talked with the safety instructors. We made that plan. We wanted to make sure that the experts were reviewing everything we were doing. Most importantly, sir, when Mr. Jones needed a signal on the day, June 21st, were you silent? No, of course not. With those things in mind, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the precautionary measures that you took that day, all right? Okay. Sir, do you remember what kind of precautionary measures you put in place to help keep Mr. Jones safe? Yeah, we did a number of things. The first and most important thing was having a team surrounding Peter. We wanted to make sure we had the best experts. We also invested in a lot of state-of-the-art technology to make sure that everything was going to go well, everything was safe, everything was monitored. And we also made sure that Peter had enough training so that when he got up there on that motorcycle, he was confident that he knew he could do the stuff. You just mentioned three different things. Your team, technology, and training. I want to take each of those pieces one at a time. So how'd you go about creating a team to help Mr. Jones be safe? Well, the first and most important thing that we did is we hired a stunt coordinator. Her name was Sky Stebbins. We used Ms. Stebbins on six out of the seven films with Peter in this action franchise we were filming. Sir, if you don't mind, using that binder in front of you, can you flip to Exhibit 34 for me? Sure. Your Honor, this is already in evidence with those redactions. Thank you. Okay. Sir, do you recognize what I'm showing you there? Yeah, this is that stunt plan that I talked about. It lays out what we were doing for the actual stunt. And it also talks about all the preparation we were going to do leading up to it and all the precautions we were going to have in place on the day of. Did that stunt coordinator and the remainder of your team help you create this plan? Yeah, they, they were the ones driving it. Again, I'm, I'm a producer. I'm on the creative side. I made sure everything looked good, but they made sure it was safe. We deferred to them. So why was it important for you to have a team in place like this to help you create this kind of plan? Well, again, we wanted to make sure that Peter was safe and that there was someone looking out for him every step of the way, both on the actual set on the day of the shooting, but even when he was practicing. We made sure that someone was reviewing every decision we made. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that second thing that you mentioned, the technology you were using. Okay. Sir, if I showed you some pictures, do you think you could explain some of the technology you put in place to help out Mr. Jones? I, I, I could probably try, yes. Sir, go ahead and flip to, for me to Exhibit 9, if that's all right. Okay. Sir, what do you see in the top right corner up there? In the top right, there's a drone camera. Again, it would be difficult to have actual camera operators when we were doing a stunt like this. So we had a lot of different drones that we had purchased to make sure that we could get a lot of angles of Peter as he was doing the stunt. You said getting angles of Peter. Did you have people stationed anywhere to make sure that they could see him? Yeah, myself and a couple other members of the production team, depending on the day, we would be in a control room. We had a lot of different monitors that the drone footage would feed into. We'd watch that footage, and that's what allowed us to make sure that we were communicating with Peter, making sure that he knew where he was relative to the ground. Sir, why was it important for you to know exactly where Peter was as he was in the air? Well, Peter, he's free falling, right? He's, he's going off the mountain, going off the ramp, and he's falling down. He obviously doesn't know where he is. But we had a tracker on Peter to make sure that we always knew what his altitude was. So that allowed us from the control room to know what signals to give him to tell him to release that parachute. I want to talk just a little bit more about what you just mentioned about giving signals. Yeah. Sir, have you heard us talking today about this earpiece holding up Exhibit 4 for the record? Yes, I have. Sir, how are you using this piece of technology to communicate with Mr. Jones? Well, sort of like you heard, Peter had it in his ear. It was connected to a walkie-talkie that we had in the control room. We would monitor everything on the screens, the device that told us where his altitude was, and then we'd communicate to that device. Did you test this? Of course. Peter had used it in a number of different runs before June 21st. So why was it important for you to establish a way for you to communicate with Mr. Jones as he was actively falling? Well, again, we wanted Peter focusing on staying safe. We wanted to take all of that, uh, the decision making out of it for him. We wanted to tell him when he needed to release the parachute, and that's what we would do. So I want to address one more of the plaintiff's allegations that they've made in trial today. Okay. 
So have you heard them here throughout trial as they've said, when he needed a signal, you were silent. Have you heard that today? Yeah, I, I've heard that, but that isn't true. Did you hear Mr. Gagulian testify to that? Yeah, I did. Sir, you just said that's not true. So what did happen in that control room? Well, we were watching the monitors as Peter started to go off the ramp. And I was watching the clock, like you heard. We wanted him to pull the release on the parachute at nine seconds. Once it got to nine, I, I pressed the button on the radio. I said, pull the cord. Sir, how did you make sure you were giving him that signal at nine seconds? We had a clock right there. We made sure that we were monitoring it. That was all I had to do. Watch the clock, hit the button, and I pressed it. I told him to pull the cord, and I told him again and again. But I saw on the monitors that he wasn't doing it. He wasn't pulling the cord. I thought maybe I wasn't being loud enough. I started getting louder. I, I kept saying to pull the cord, but he wasn't listening. I wasn't seeing him do it. What happened? after you told Mr. Jones over and over again to pull his cord. I, I don't know what was going on. I don't know if he could hear me or what. But as he was getting closer and closer to the ground, he, he finally pulled the cord, he, he released the parachute, and I thought that he was going to be safe, that maybe he could make it. But he was just going too fast when he got to the ground. And he didn't make it. Thank you for your time today, Mr. Doyle. Thank you. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. Thank Permission you. to publish some of those admitted exhibits to the members of the jury? Of course. And when you're done with that, Mr. Harper, you can do your cross-examination. For, yes, for the record, publishing exhibits 12, 34, 18, and 16. Thank you. Mr. Doig, your company had Peter do a dangerous stunt, right? Yeah, that's right. I would say it was pretty dangerous. He was going to go off a mountain at 3,000 feet in parachute to the ground below. That's right. That's what we had in practice. When you did this stunt, you knew timing was essential, right? Absolutely. The time to send a signal to release the parachute. That's right. Right. He needed a signal to release that parachute in time. That's right. You knew if he didn't release that parachute in time, he might die. Yeah, it, it's possible if he didn't release the parachute, there wouldn't be enough time for him to land. Sir, I want to walk through those attempts, those different times you ran this stunt, OK? OK. Sir, on June 20th, Peter Jones ran this exact stunt, right? That's right. That was the first day of filming. This time you gave the signal. Well, I gave the signal every time. I know you're saying that now, but you gave the signal, right? Objection, Your Honor. Counsel's testifying. Your Honor, not testifying. I said he gave the signal. It's a question. Overruled on that grounds. Yeah, sure. You gave the signal on June 20th. Yeah, that's right. He landed safely. Yes, he did. Sir, you weren't happy with that, were you? I wouldn't say I was unhappy that he landed safely, no. Sir, when he got to the ground, you told him, mm, we need to do something bigger, right? Right. We, we wanted to make sure there was a little bit more time, that we got some more footage, so we wanted him to run the stunt again. No, no, no. You wanted to make sure he pulled his parachute later. That's what you wanted. Right, so that we could get more amount of footage with him doing the drop. And sir, when you told him to pull that parachute later, it wasn't because you were trying to keep your star safe, right? Well, yeah, like we were trying to get more footage. That's true. It's because you thought the footage you had wasn't compelling. That's right. It's my job to focus on that kind of stuff. It's that you thought the audience would want to see something bigger. Right. We wanted to make sure that there was more footage. You wanted to make this the biggest stunt in Hollywood history. Yeah, we, we all did. So you told Peter, hey, wait to pull the parachute. I will signal you. That's right. That was always the plan. 
You said, I will signal you at nine seconds. That's right. Peter agreed. That's right. So on June 21st, Peter's on top of that mountain again right before his jump, right? That's true. He was. You're in the control room. That's right. And sir, I know that you're saying you gave that signal that day. But you know we have a witness that says you did it. Yeah, I heard him testify. I don't know if he didn't hear me. I, I don't know why he's saying that. But I gave that signal. Sir, he says you were in that room. You didn't give a signal at all. That's what he said, yes. He said he screamed at you, please signal. You didn't do it. That's right. That didn't happen. Sir, you're saying he's not telling the truth? I don't know if he's mistaken, if he's misremembering it, but it didn't happen that way. You're saying it didn't happen that way. I want to ask your opinion of that witness that just testified. You think he's one of the few honest people in the city? Yeah, I, I would say that, sure. You think he's very honest? You'd believe him. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I trusted him. He was someone on our staff, sure. Sir, after Peter Jones crashed that day, you went down to see his body. I did, that's right. Mr. Eli asked you, why did you do that? Do you remember when he said that? Yeah, he said something like that. You said, well, I just wanted a longer shot. Right, I was explaining why we had waited longer. No, over his body, he asked you, why did you do that in the control room? And you said, I just wanted a longer shot. That happened, answer. right? Sustained. Mr. Doy, the first time you told us this story, you weren't fully honest with us, were you? That's right. I said that I didn't remember some of the things that happened that day. That's right. I asked you one time in a deposition, you said, oh, I don't remember. That's true. I did. Then I told you, hey, I'm going to go get a witness that will testify to what happened. Right. There were a lot of crew members there that day. Then you said, oh, hold on, Mr. Hubbard. I actually do remember now. I remember it all. That's right. I, I said what happened. You were dishonest. That's true. I was. Then you said, well, Mr. Hubbard, what had happened was... Well, Mr. Eli, he'd asked me, why did you wait so long? You remember that? Right, like we talked about. After Mr. Eli asked you, why did you wait so long? Why didn't you give him the signal? You said nothing. Yeah, it was very emotional. I was dealing with the death of someone I'd worked with for 10 years. You didn't say, I didn't know this was going to happen. What are you talking about? I definitely gave him the signal. No, I, I, I wasn't focusing on that at that time. Right. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Can you read your rep? Yes, Your Honor. May I proceed? You may. Mr. Doig. Just want to clear up a couple of things that were ta you talked about Mr. Hubbard with, okay? Okay. Sir, he asked you about whether or the reasons behind why you changed that stunt. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Sir, when you made the decision to change the stunt, did you consult with your staff to make sure it was still safe? I did, yes. They approved any of the changes. And of course, I talked about it with Peter, and I made sure that he was okay with it, too. He asked you about whether you've been honest throughout this entire trial. Sir, have you been honest about what happened in that control room? I have. I gave him that signal. I don't know what Eli remembers. I don't know what he heard. All I can tell you is that I gave him that signal. Did you take measures to make sure that Mr. Jones was safe? Of course. I worked with him for years. I wanted him safe. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Thank you. Um, any recross counsel? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Doy, before you were in that witness chair and had to look those members of the jury in the eye, you lied about what happened in this case. That's right. I said that I didn't remember what happened after he died. That's true. Nothing further. 
Thank you. No, re redirect your honor. May the witness step down and resume his seat. Yes, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Judge. And your honor, at this time, we'd rest our case in chief. We're ready to move into closing arguments. All right. Thanks. Give us 30 seconds here just to. Sure, your honor. Thank you. Appreciate it. Everybody else ready? You may proceed. Yes, Ron. May it please the court. Peter Jones. And that is what he heard as he was hurtling through the sky, waiting for a signal. That silence is what he heard when he needed someone to save him. It's deafening. But as anyone who's ever lost someone knows, that silence lasts forever. You hear that silence at birthday parties, graduations, family reunions, family dinner table. That silence will be in the Jones family household forever. Members of the jury, when you look at this case, you look at the actions of this defendant, remember why they did it. They told you, well, we wanted to keep our star safe. Does that line up with what you know? Think about what the testimony was when they changed it to wait for nine seconds. He didn't say it's because I wanted to keep them safe. He didn't say I thought that would be better. He wanted to do it for a movie. All lost set. That's what he risks Peter's life for. Remember the drink, when a company acts like that, we call it negligence. When they refuse to provide reasonable care to an employee of theirs, it's against the law. And we proved that to you today. By those same three things we told you we would. We had to prove that they were negligent. That Peter Jones died. And that when he died, it was because of their negligence. And we did that. Let's walk through those three one last time. That stunt, that silence, and that signal. Starting with that stunt, you heard just how dangerous it was. Sheer mountaintops, 3,000 foot drops. And while they can stand here and say, we did all we could. We made precautionary measures. We had the tech, we had the technology. We did it all. Members of the jury, that's not why they were negligent. 
They're negligent when they didn't give that signal. And what you heard today was, on the stand, from their defense, well, they didn't train them on what to do if you didn't get the signal. All those practice jumps, all those times, all those drones they were talking about, none of that matters if he doesn't get the signal. Mr. you heard about that signal, how he was supposed to get it, and it was easy. Just this little earphone. And they tried to get up here and say, oh, I don't know if it worked. I mean, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Members of the jury, what we do know is that their own defendant said they tested it six times. But then they want you to believe it suddenly cut out. Today, your job is to decide what's more likely than not. If 50 and a feather, just a little bit more. That'll bring us to the side. Members of the jury, Mr. Jones told you that you were going to hear two different stories. One witness was going to tell you he did give the signal. One witness was going to tell you he didn't. Today, your job is to evaluate the credibility of those witnesses. Just because two people say it doesn't mean it's 50-50. So think about what you heard today. Mr. Eli, a respected agent, somebody who went to law school, somebody who sat on that stand and recounted exactly what happened. He has no reason to lie, no reason to be dishonest, no reason to be mistaken. Well, then you have the defendant. And members of the jury, you may have to take my word for it. Just think about what he said right here when he was on the stand, what he had to admit. I was dishonest about this case when you first asked me. That's true. But I swear I'm telling the truth now. Members of the jury, is that reasonable? And think about the circumstances in which it happened. We're in a deposition. Closed room, jury's not there, you weren't there. We're asking him questions. He lies. We tell him we're going to catch him, we'll call another witness, oh, then I found the truth. And that's how the story changes. Members of the jury, you can't trust a word he says. If he's willing to lie, you don't think he'd be willing to save himself now? When his company is on the line, members of the jury, you know he was silent. This is what makes sense. I told you at the beginning of today's trial, I wanted you to listen for evidence about that signal. No matter what Mr. Jones got up here and told you, I told you I wanted you to think about the signal. It's true. All the precautionary measures he told you about, they went on 500 test runs. They had all this technology. But think about what he hasn't addressed. None of those precautionary measures matter if he didn't get that signal. And you have every reason in the world to believe he didn't. More likely than not. We'll ask you to use your common sense. Evaluate the credibility. And reach a decision. We'll ask you to find this defendant. Lie. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Mr. Harvey's defense. Pleasure. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, approach the jury and grab a copy of Exhibit 16. Of course. Thank you so much. May I proceed? You may. 
May please court. They wanted to keep their star safe. Members of the jury, what's important in this trial is some of the promises that you were given at the beginning of this trial. So I want to take you back a little bit to what Mr. Hubbard promised you he would prove by a preponderance of the evidence and see where we're at. Because today, members of the jury, he promised you that he would prove Dragon Studios made dangerous decisions. He promised you that he would show that this studio breached their duty of care to Mr. Jones, and most importantly, he promised you that he would show that there was silence in that control room. But those promises, members of the jury, they're just words until they can bring you some evidence to actually back them up. That evidence? It didn't exist. And contrary to what Mr. Hubbard has told you throughout this trial, it absolutely matters all the precautionary measures that this company did to make sure Mr. Jones was safe. You know why? Because the burden to prove that they weren't, that rests solely on this tape. It is Mr. Hubbard and Mr. Hubbard alone whose job it is to prove to you by a preponderance of the evidence that things they did put Mr. Jones' life at risk. They have failed to meet that burden of proof. They have failed to show you a coherent story because what the facts have shown <coughs> is that they wanted to keep their star safe. That matters. That matters. So I'm going to take you through the ways that they kept their star safe. The team that they put into place. The technology that they used to do it and the training that they gave Mr. Jones just to make sure he was ready. Let's start with the team. Because today you got to see this document. Creation of a plan agreed to by Mr. Jones, agreed to by the stunt coordinator, agreed to by everyone who mattered who could offer an opinion about whether or not what he was going to be doing on that day was a safe plan. Why does that matter? Because having that team in place, it shows that they cared about the safety of their soul. It shows that they put effort into making sure that all the things he was going to be doing that day were safe. That takes us to that second. The technology. Because members of the jury, I can tell you over and over again that there was technology used to track Mr. Jones' movements, but you don't have to take any word for it. You have the evidence. This is a picture of a control room, and if you look at it, you can see them looking at Mr. Jones as he's falling through the air. Why does that matter? Because they care about tracking where he is, they care about knowing where he is, they care about deploying his parachute on time, they care about not being silent when it matters, they care about making sure they know when to give him the signal. They used state-of-the-art technology to make sure that he was safe. But more than that, perhaps the most important measure that they took was that third thing, his strength. This piece of evidence, members of the jury, it might not look like a lot. But what this is, is a giant ramp. A ramp built by Cole Doig in his studios just to make sure that Mr. Jones could practice this stunt over and over again. And look at it. It's not short. It is hundreds of feet long, hundreds of feet in the air just so he can practice getting this stunt done properly. They trained him extensively on what to do. They trained him extensively on exactly how to handle any kind of situation. He knew exactly what he was supposed to do. He knew exactly what he was going to do because he was trained. They took those precautionary measures because they wanted to keep him safe. With those things in mind, members of the jury, I want to address some of the plaintiff's allegations because over and over again, they've talked to you about whether or not the defendant was silent at the time Mr. Jones needed a signal. He had two conflicting accounts. Mr. Gagulian, who told you that Mr. Doig, he didn't say a word during that control room while he was there. And Mr. Doig, who told you that yes, he did scream over that microphone to tell Mr. Jones to deploy that parachute. 
It's an easy question that you can ask here, who to believe, but that's not quite what you have to do. Because I want to remind you and bring you back to that burden of proof. Because it's this table and this table alone whose burden it is to show you which of those witnesses is much more trustworthy. And they haven't done that. They haven't ruled out that that account is reliable from Mr. Doy. They haven't showed you, we're not claiming today that Mr. Gagulian is lying, but this was a stressful event. He was watching someone he cared about parachute down a mountain. It's possible that he misremembered those events. And if they're going to claim that that's not the truth, they better bring you some evidence to back it up. You have no recordings of that conversation. This was a high-tech control room. Why haven't there been any pieces of evidence that can tell you that Mr. Doyle confirmed did not make that call? Especially when in the six times he had done this successfully over and over and over again, he took that exact step. Contrary to what they want you to believe, it's not negligence when a company wants to go for a longer shot. It's negligence when they don't put effort, when they don't put care that a reasonable company would in protecting their stall. What this team did, they created a team to make sure he was safe. They used technology to make sure they knew exactly where he was, and they trained him extensively on the exact movements he was going to do. Those actions are not actions of a company who doesn't care. Actions of a company who was silent when they needed to be loud. Those are actions of a company who's not responsible for Mr. Jones' death. Find them not liable. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor. You may. Let's think about all the things that would need to be true if Mr. Jones is correct. First off, they need you to believe that Peter was so well trained over 500 jumps that he could have done this perfectly and that he'd done it perfectly before. But they also <coughs> need you to believe that he got the signal and ignored it, just fell to his death because he wanted to. More likely than not. What makes sense? They need you to believe that Mr. Eli, he's just misremembering the whole thing. He had a stressful day. I don't know, maybe he just misremembered, shouting at him to save his friend. Or the defendant who admitted he was dishonest in the past is being dishonest now. More likely than not. Mr. Jones made a big deal about telling you more likely than not, and he's right. We have that burden, but we embrace it. It's your decision. More likely than not. Thank you. Excellent job. Give us a minute here to do ballots and then uh, we'll make some very brief comments.